You're listening to STB Radio. Hello everyone. I'm Smita Mishra and welcome to this episode of STP Radio. I will be your host today for this episode in a series of interviews that we are conducting with several speakers who will be attending our upcoming STP Spring Conference. STP Con will be in San Francisco, California from April 4th through April 7th this year. Be sure to check out stpcon.com where you can learn more about the conference, the speakers, our special events, and our conference pricing. You can also follow us on Twitter and Instagram. Our handle is Software Test Pro. So let's meet our guests now. Today we are interviewing two folks who are very popular leaders in the agile world and who have done a lot of work together and also with STPCon. So folks, here we have with us Bob Galen, an agile methodologist, practitioner, and coach based in Cary, North Carolina, and Mary Thorne, who's a strong leader in agile testing methodologies based in Raleigh, again, North Carolina. So let's get started with a quick introduction from each of our guests, guests today. Uh, so Bob and Mary, please let us know a little about you, your backgrounds, how you got into testing, what you're doing in the agile world, and anything else you would like to share with us about you. Mary, we could start with you. So yeah, my name is Mary Thorne. I have been in the software testing industry for about 20 years. Uh, over the past 10 years when Agile and Scrum became very popular, I very much worried that I would lose my job as a test manager and became a Scrum Master certified in case one day I would lose my job. Uh, that actually never happened, thank goodness. But uh, with that said, I became an Agile coach and a test leader at the same time. Uh, a lot of times people say, when you come in as a test leader to organizations that you're, you know, your testers, you have a testing problem. And for me, it was never a testing problem. A lot of times it's a process problem. So being able to look at things holistically from being an Agile coach and a test leader has really helped uh, be successful in, in my career. I tell people I'm passionate about three things. I'm passionate about Agile, automation, and and and, uh, and continuous improvement. And, and from that, um, that's where I lead my teams from. Uh, so that's a little bit about me. I work at a company called iPrio. Uh, they do so, uh, financial technology software, and it's, it's a pretty awesome place to work. We're going through a big agile transition uh, transformation right now, so lots of cool challenges, um, especially being able to trans to be able to transform the ag- uh, at scale. So we're we're implementing scaled agile framework and really doing some cool things there. So it's it's fun. All right, thanks, Mary. Uh, Bob, we could hear from you now. Oh, sure. Uh, thanks for having me, Smita. Uh, so I, I've i been testing for, uh, I'm a bit of a dinosaur for folks, I think. So I've been testing for slightly longer than Mary. So, so, <laughs> you're, not, you're not extinct, though, so you're not a dinosaur. <laughs> so I'm not quite distinct yet. Thank, thank you for, for confirming that I'm alive. Uh, so, uh, but uh, no, I've been, I, I'm a developer by, by training, and I started out in software development, and I grew. Um, in that career, I grew into leadership roles and director and, and VP roles. And over the years, I started um, leading test teams. And, and years ago, uh, I attended, I didn't feel like I wanted to lead testers without knowing testing. So I remember my first class was someone uh, by the name of Ross Collard. Years and years ago, I attended a four-day class. And it's a funny story. I, I didn't even want, they asked what everyone's roles were. And uh, everyone in the class were, were, were testers. And uh, I was the only developer and I didn't, I didn't uh, identify myself. I sort of hid. I didn't. I didn't want to be uh, identified coming from the dark side, but it was a great class, and um, I learned a lot. And I'm, I'm a student of software development and a student of testing. Uh, and then I started sharing some of my leadership lessons, uh, leading testers, uh, leading test efforts, test strategy, uh, test automation. And this was before Agile. Uh, and then I was bitten by the Agile bug very early on. Uh, and became an Agile coach, and that's what I do today. I'm an independent Agile coach and uh, transformation, uh, and I'm passionate. Mary has three passions. I, I have one that's very general. It's it's Agile. Uh, I think it's a force multiplier for teams. It's not a silver bullet, but if done well, it can be a phenomenal success pattern, uh, and I just enjoy being a, sort of an evangelist out in the community, and, uh, and I've been working with STP for 
for a few years, and I enjoy the conferences and I enjoy the collaboration. Right. The way you were telling your story, I was like, I want to hear more and more and more, but I guess we'll have to move on with other questions. So uh, I, I see you've written at once at, at some point that you are known as a servant leader. And when I read that, it actually brought me to the point that we were talking about your uh, unique thing that not many people know about you is that you are a farm, farm boy, like you've bought, been brought up there. So is, is there a correlation between your uh, management style because of what you have learned? I don't know about the servant leader. I, I, I think the, the correlation to my to my childhood is, is hard work. I, I, I keep it private, but I work, I get up very early still uh, to this day, uh, and I work incredibly hard. I believe in hard work. I, I believe that that will drive successes, uh, both personally. I mean, I've written a few books, and, and if you've ever written a book, it's a lot of hard work. So, so my work ethic, I, can, I attribute to that. Um, I think my, I have people centricity. Very early on in my career, early on in my management career, I had the aha moment that people matter rather than project plans matter. And this was pre-agile or, uh, you know, you know uh, technology matters, that people are the fundamental, you know, success equation uh, in, any, in, in any endeavor. And so then I started realizing as a leader that it wasn't about me. Uh, it was about it was about the people and serving them and what can I do uh, to create success through the people. Now that was that was pre agile, but if you know anything about the agile methods or the agile mindset, it aligns really well with that. So that's that's one of my core um, the core reasons why I, I uh, get so passionate uh, about agility is it, it aligns with me personal. It, it aligns with some of my per- personal attributes. Awesome, awesome. So let's let's talk about the conference. Uh, a little bit here. Uh, I'm sorry about the background here. Each of you have, uh, I believe, some great workshops and sessions coming up, and I would like for you to share with our audience a bit about each of them. I think uh, we have two workshops being done by both of you together, one about Agile Test Practices and the other about uh, Agile Test Team Leadership. So I also heard probably Bob told me that these are new workshops that you worked on and so I would really like to for you to share with us how these evolved. Like not exactly new but these have evolved. So, Mary, do you want to take a stab want? at it? Uh sure. Uh so we have been show- we wrote a book, uh Bob uh, wrote most of it. Like you said, right writing books are hard. I'm I'm a chief storyteller. Called the three pillars of agile testing. From that, we created a three pillars of agile testing workshop that we've been doing together for a, a couple of years now. And with that said, there was specific points where we decided we need to start to deep dive into some of the practices that we talk about in the book, some of the leadership things that really help uh, lead lead the testers in that in through that book. And so we decided to create these two new workshops uh, as more of a deeper dive into certain chapters into the book that we haven't gotten to at right yet. Uh, so uh, the first one around agile testing techniques uh, is, is really the best practices of when you transform from waterfall to agile, things that you can do to help reduce risk when you move from a waterfall world to an agile testing world. And then the second part is that transformation is hard. And so the test leadership uh, workshop is all around how do you lead through that transformation? How do you um, once you have a transformed organization to Scrum or Kanban, then what is the role of the tester, test manager then, and how is that different than it is you know, potentially today in a waterfall world? And so those, again, are deeper dives into um, how, how it came from evolving from our book um, and, and areas that we felt like uh, we could add a lot of value. Bob, you want to add anything to that? Oh, sure. I, I mean, the thing, the thing that Mary and I, if you've ever attended our workshops, um, then you you've learned there's there's uh, good news good news and better news I guess is it, it, we have a lot of content and uh, and then we rarely get to all of it so and and I usually blame that on Mary because she talks too much but, but, but we know that's not true <laughs> but, but we know we know the truth by, by the end yeah by the end of this uh, interview we'll surely know <laughs> thank you for that. so. 
And we know that I talk too much. <laughs> and, so, and, and we miss, we missed a lot of important content. And so we would try to cover, we had a transformation workshop and it was a half day and sometimes we would deliver it in the day. And even in both, in both um, session formats, we found that we were leaving things, important things on the table. So what we decided to do is really split it and have a half day deep dive into practitioner sort of test techniques. So we're going, for example, we're going to talk about exploratory testing in, in that workshop because it's such an interesting, it, it's not an agile technique, but it, it complements agile teams and agile testing so wonderfully well. And we're not just going to talk about it, but we're going to practice it. So in the techniques workshop, at the end of each technique, we're going to look at mind mapping, for example, and we're going to look at um, exploratory testing, and we're going to look at BDD. We're also going to get some hands-on activity, which we're excited about. And we would never really get to that in the previous workshop. And then in the management workshop uh, or the leadership workshop, we're going to do the same thing. We're going to get a chance to do some simulations, some leadership simulations, some, ag some uh, agile dynamic simulations and do some deep dives of what does it really mean? I think ag prospective agile test leaders need to understand the dynamics and we're going to give you, a, we're going to give them a chance to really explore that. So Mary said it, they're deep dives. We've split it up that way. And we're excited, I think, with the, the hands-on activity that we're going to generate. So we're looking forward to that. Wow. Mind mapping, exploratory testing, BDD, hands-on exercises, leadership simulations, understanding dynamics, and deep diving into it. Wow. That's like, I'm, I'm actually looking forward to now attend this workshop myself. That's great. Uh, I, I think, Mary, you, you, you also have a session. Uh, do you want to talk about that session that you, uh, I believe it's um, What's in Your Cup of Tea, which you're doing individually? Yeah, so over the past several years, working uh, with moving trans waterfall teams to, to, to Agile, one of the things that I've had to really do a lot of and I, I pride myself in is upskilling and training and coaching my testers from being waterfall testers to agile testers. And with that said, the, the role of the tester, you know, or the skill set of the tester changes and, and you're asked to do a little bit more and that comes into like the T-shaped concept. And the T-shaped concept is all around, you know, your core of the T, the shape of the T is still testing, but you know, the, the horizontal part of the T, uh, you might be asked to do business requirements or you might ask to be doing test automation or customer support. You have to do a little bit more. And so I, I explain that concept and how you become more of a, bring more value in, in as a tester uh, when, you, when you transform from waterfall to agile and some practices that I have used to upskill the testers to learn and, and provide more value than they did before. Is this T-shaped uh, expertise uh, something like, I, I also heard about a pie-shaped expertise somewhere, so is it like on the same line? Um, it's one of those things where, where I haven't heard pie-shaped, I have to look that one, that one <laughs> okay. up. Uh, yeah. it, it's one of those concepts where uh, T-shaped, a lot of people in the um, Agile community talk about generalist and that anybody on a scrum team should be able to pick up any task. And that goes uh -huh. towards the way that Google tests software or how even some of the, the you know, Microsoft tests software for a long time, that the, the, the role of the tester now is just uh, they can do development, they can do everything. I, um. I disagree with that to some extent. Mm -hmm. and, mm -hmm. and what I say is, yeah, the tester needs to do more, but I value the craft of software testing. And not everybody can be a, 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 a generalist. And so... Uh, in the world of the T shape, the generalist um, is the is that horizontal part of the T, and I'm actually saying, yeah, we can have some horizontalness where you can do more than the craft of testing. You know, like like I said, you can do some development or automation or some requirements gathering. But I still believe that there's this the, the mindset of the tester. Uh, you need to have at least one person on the team with that that mindset, and so that's really what it's about. Yeah. So definitely a, a, a good tester has to be, I mean, if you have to do good testing, you have to also know your testing deep dive and into the depths and then the horizontal helps you to understand the domains and the technologies. Right. Yeah. So uh, thanks, Mary. Uh, Bob, uh, you also have a session it's called a tester's guide to collaborating with product owners. Do you want to tell us more about what you're going to talk 
out sure. there? Sure. Uh, I mean, the, again, this is one of those agile topics. This is one of my favorite presentations. I've been doing this for a number of years. I've delivered this in China. <laughs> I've delivered it uh, internationally and I did in other places, and I've delivered it nationally. Um What's what's important, I think, is uh, there's three roles really in agile team. Let's call them scrum teams. There's a uh, there's the team has a role. There's a, a role of scrum master, and there's a role of product owner. Uh, the product owner is is a very difficult role. Uh, it has a lot of responsibility. Has a lot of accountability. It's it's driving the ask. It's driving. It's the surrogate customer. Uh, they're asking the teams to deliver, and they're also verifying the delivery at the end, and they're signing off on it. And uh, it's an ideation role. It's a confirmation role. Uh, acceptance criteria, acceptance tests are, are typically driven from the product owner. So I think there's a lot of synergy or potential synergy between testers and product owners, uh, both not at just at the back of the line, if you will, on the confirmation side of stories, but on the front of the line. And I emphasize a lot on uh, testers con uh, working with product owners. And what I mean at the front of the line is in developing stories and writing good stories before they even get executed. And I, I really want to energize testers who are new or even in existing agile teams to, to make their product owner their, their partner, to collaborate with them. Uh, I think even one of my last suggestions is to uh, take them to lunch and to break bread with them and to uh, strategize with the product owner how you're, how they have a team and they and the tester are solving the customer's problems and delivering excellence and delivering value. So there's some wonderful, it, the test, it's not just a team, you're not just a team member. I want to inspire agile testers to, to it's a wonderful opportunity in this context to do way more than quote unquote just testing. And, and that's the nature of this this workshop. Uh, so that sounded that was a lot of words. It's an it's an hour workshop. Uh, it's an hour talk. Uh, but but it really is. I, I think if you if you uh, if you're an agile tester and you're working in a team, and if you feel marginalized to any degree, or if you feel an arrow, come to this come to this talk, and and hopefully you leave with uh, some renewed purpose. Mm -hmm. Perfect. And. I I agree with you absolutely because I, I wonder sometimes that of all the kinds of testing we do, uh, how would uh, how would we ever be able to do a good user experience testing if you're not really collaborating with product owners really really close because that's that's like and that's one of the most important uh, testing that I understand uh, that's happening these days from the perspective of uh, success of an application or success of a product. Uh, uh, software. Absolutely. I mean, and Agile presents this wonderful opportunity. I mean, I mean, historically, testing has been sort of the silo and this this waterfall sort of silo and handoffs and things. But Agile has changed that game, and we have to step into that. And I think it's created wonderful, you know, teamwork and synergistic opportunities for team members. But you have to; they're not free. They're not handed to you. You have to you have to grasp them. And, and I, I think those opportunities are there, though, and they're very exciting. Awesome. So since we are talking with you, Bob, on this uh, collaboration point, I also saw that you had stated in one of your profiles that you have a knack for turning around struggling teams and struggling projects in a sustainable and productive way. So what, what, what do you feel is the turning point for teams that are struggling, and how do you assess the gaps, and how do you try to resolve them? I mean, I'll, I'll use agile techniques, and and my first point is I regret saying that because I, that sounds very uh, bold. Uh, so I'm not sure I'm not sure if I'm a great turnaround. Artist. But but, <laughs> okay. but but I do encounter. I I mean, as an agile coach, uh, I mean, literally as we speak, I'm in California, and I have a four day coaching engagement, and and as part of the job, you're assessing teams and you're assessing organizations, and you're su making suggestions for them, and and you do training. And I think the key in turning things around, a couple of agile keys are one, uh, the, the notion of a retrospective or the notion of uh, the team or the organization or both uh, reviewing their strengths, reviewing their weaknesses, identifying what are the key impediments they have, having helping them identify that and then helping them to game plan. How do they overcome those things and then help, and, and guiding them, providing suggestions, but not telling them 
how to solve their problems, but guiding them towards that. And then guiding them towards executing on those ideas and inspiring them. And I have good success, I think, in doing that. So there's that notion of, uh, of a retrospective, but an action-oriented retrospective, and then having some expert guidance, but not being overpowering. Uh, the, the second thing from Agile is transparency is just honestly showing the organizations. Very often organizations are in denial. We, you know, we, we use excuses and there's this agile notion of just re- reflection, but also the transparency of are we making progress? So showing the data, showing the progress and, and running experiments and saying, Hey, let's try something. Let's not stay in our own. Let's not stay where we've been. But let's try some experiments, see what's working, and let's get into a continuous improvement loop. And I think my I have a, a relatively good style of doing that. The other the other benefit I have is a lot of experience. Again, I, I'm a dinosaur, so even that waterfall experience and that <laughs> agile experience, I, I have a tendency to be able to use that to my advantage in communicating and inspiring clients. Awesome, great. So uh, thanks, Bob. Uh, Mary, I'm, I'm going to ask you the same question put a little differently. What do you think is the major struggle in organizations that want to move to Agile? I mean, do you, have you encountered them in the organizations that you have worked with? And how do you, how did you resolve them? Uh, so that's that's a great question. Um, I can even take some of the experiences of, of you know, recently, like my current company has moved from Waterfall to Agile, probably three fourths there. I think our biggest struggle is is not only the amount of change that you that one will go through, but it's also how do you lead through that change and uh, reset expectations at, um, at all levels of the organization. When you move a company from Waterfall to Agile, you know it affects account management, it affects sales, it account affects customer support. And a lot of times those pieces are not thought about when you move your development processes from waterfall to agile and the way, you know, just the things of things like how something, a request now comes from a client into your backlog or for support or from implementations, that whole process changes. And, you know, you go, you, a lot of times we'll go from a committed work now to, we, we're not going to commit to your work client or we're going to, uh, put it in a backlog and we'll get to it in the next quarter type of conversation. And that's very uncomfortable for, for your clients. That's uncomfortable for those salespeople and those account managers to reset the expectations. And a lot of times those people aren't trained uh, with the new processes. And so when you think about transformation, they're often the last ones transformed as far as how to set expectations, which then causes a basically a waterfall behavior because they've already went and promised a lot of things um, for the next year, and now the scrum teams are committed to dates, which is never a good thing. So, from a perspective of what's that's one of the biggest challenges that, that we are having right now is is basically going back and training the other parts of the organization that are affected by the transformation. How do you now you know, put your your items for the clients into the funnel, and then how do you how how does that work long term and setting expectations of when they're going to now d- deliver that versus a hard hard code a date and, and ways to fix it is really, really trying to get ahead of that over communicating trying to set up uh, groups to to handle that transformation handle that communication handle that training uh, we have an agile methods team that that we've incorporated just at iprio and part of their job will be to, to make sure that those groups understand how are, how are the new ways to get these these uh, changes into our product backlogs and how to set the correct expectations with our clients. Okay. Um, so besides besides this agile transformation, since you also mentioned that uh, besides uh, agile transformation, which you just mentioned that you implemented in April, uh, you also say that you have passion for automation and continuous improvement. And I believe in your role, you've had experience in many aspects of testing, uh, maybe the standard hands-on testing, then you've done automation, you've had test leadership roles, you've done risk-based testing, exploratory testing. So which of these areas you've enjoyed the most besides, I mean, Agile on the... Yeah, that's a great question. Um, for the past, you know, seven or eight years, I've really 
uh, try to ingrain myself in behavior-driven development and BDD and the benefits that you get from that and building automation frameworks around BDD and behavior-driven development. With that said, you know, at IPRIO, we don't – With once I've started to actually implement these tools, I've gone away from any type of proprietary automation tools. So most of the time, my test automation is open source. So whether it's Cucumber driving Selenium or SpecFlow driving – Selenium, um, you know, we. My goal is to build a framework that's that specifically works for the the company that I am uh, working with. And so, you know, from a passion passion perspective, uh, I, I feel very strongly that you know any automation tool should should have some type of behavior driven development framework around it to be able to use the common language that that gives you and the benefits that that come about it. And so, you know. I do a lot of upskilling. So, so between, you know, really trying to build an automation framework that's right for that company, as well as, you know, uh, the second part of that is upskilling the testers that you have uh, around the techniques that, that are going to be good for that company. And so one of the other things I'm very passionate about around the continuous improvement is I, I always tell people when I start a new job, you're going to go through a 52-week boot camp, one hour a week, and we're going to go through a different either a t- testing te- technique, automation technique, domain technique, as far as learning that domain, and, and upskilling the testers to, to put the value into them to make sure they, they understand what good looks like. Uh, that's why one of the reasons that Bob and I wrote the book about what we feel good looks like from an agile testing approach. And with that said, mm-hmm. you know, we've, we've become very passionate about about the book, about um, the techniques that we've implemented. So, again, you know, I, one of the things I, that I'm, you know, super passionate about is test automation and, and BDD, but it's just really bringing the whole experience together around our three pillars, and our three pillars are around test automation, around testing techniques, and then really around uh, the softer skills of the third pillar, which is just uh, a pairing and, 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 and communication between testers and developers and and product owners and so really putting all three pieces of those together uh, is is kind of how I lead the way through through all of this transformation great thank you so you you mentioned about this book uh, the three pillars of agile and quality testing and I guess you and Bob wrote it together so uh, and 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 you mentioned more or less what the outline of it is, but I would still like to ask both of you, it, uh, what really motivated you to write it, and what do you expect your readers to take away from it when when your when a reader is actually going through it? What should their objective be to learn from it? Bob, why don't you take that? Sure. Uh, I mean, the key thing, one of the observations that uh, it was the inspiration for the book actually is an observation that I had uh, that uh, the, the teams were imbalanced in their approach to agile transformation. And, it, and, it, and usually teams, and I'm not trying to stereotype, but usually organizations and teams lead with technology. So they lead with their sweet spot, which is writing automation or uh, you know writing code or writing uh, data sets and things like that and, and environments. And then they forget other things uh, like uh, test planning or they forget other things like writing good user stories and and product owner collaboration. And so I, I had went to a client, I visited a client, and I saw this. Uh, they were all in on BDD, so they had literally thousands and thousands of BDD tests running, and they were flashing red and green, and they were passing and failing. But then I went into a backlog refinement session with one of their teams, and they couldn't write a user story to save their life. And I asked myself the question, well, where were the BDD tests coming from? Because if you know anything about user stories and acceptance criteria, that should be the genesis of the BDD tests, and it wasn't. Uh, so, so they were misaligned. So the three pillars is really sort of a, a, a depth and breadth alignment tool from my point of view. Of And Mary, Mary said it nicely. It talks about what does good look like from an agile point of view. And it's not just narrowly and vertically implementing things, but there's a depth and a breadth to the strategy. So the three pillars is a strategy for depth and breadth, for balance, Mm -hmm. for effectiveness. Mm -hmm. Uh, It's really targeted not at the individual tester. It's targeted at the the test leader or manager or director or anyone who's trying to, or even an agile coach for an organization who's trying not to let test behind. That's another pattern that, that we see is uh, that the developers drive agile transformations very often and we want testing testers 
and test strategies and balance to have a seat at that table. Uh, but it's a very short book. I made it sound biblical in proportions there. Uh, it's, it's not, it's not that big. It's not, that, it's, it, we, I'm, I'm, I've read it. Yeah. Yes. I've, read it. I've really enjoyed it. Yeah. So, so that was the intent. Mary, uh, you can disagree with me. Or no, he, you nailed it. Great. So, Bob, I have under small question for you, which is, people, I, I hear people talk about big A and little A agile. So why do they do this? Like, and have you been in a position to yeah. ever come, uh, come in, uh, come into this discussion and resolve it? Or have you been able to, ha- have you actually witnessed any such discussion and which side have you taken? And Mary, you can add to it and we can let Bob in, in his theory that you talk more. That's, that's fine. <laughs> <laughs> so, so, uh, I, I have one, I've used it Two, I've heard it. Mm-hmm. Uh, I used a variation of it that's just yesterday. I talked about big L leadership and little L leadership. And, and so uh, let's use big. So big A agile, what people are saying is that folks are getting stuck on agile as a method. They're getting stuck on scrum and doing scrum and doing scrum by the book. Uh, and then little A agile is doing agile uh, and, and giving yourself, having the experience to, to, pick the pieces that work, but having the experience to pick the right pieces. Uh, so, uh, Smita, from a context, you have a context-driven, uh, the context-driven school of testing. Uh, mm-hmm. I would call little a agile the context-driven school of agile and big a agile the non-context-driven school, if that makes sense. And that's what people are trying to say. And I, I lean towards uh, little a agile. I also lean towards little L leadership, which is I want uh, I want situational leadership, uh, and I want servant leadership. And so a big L leader would be someone who's you know big headed about themselves. They make it about themselves. Uh, and little L leadership to me is about more you know servant leadership and things. I hope that helped. Uh, it is wow. a it is a common it is a common discussion out there. I again I'm not saying anyone's right or wrong. I think a purist attitude, though, in general, like a by the book, I'm going to implement. There's something called the scaled agile framework, or there's a bunch of agile scaled frameworks nowadays. I think blindly using anything uh, as, and and thinking that you're going to get great results is is probably a bad strategy. But that's just me. Awesome, and I, I, uh, Mary, you want to add to it? Nope, he nailed it again. <laughs> oh no! Oh no! And I and I prove, no, and I no, proven the hypothesis that Mary talks too much. <laughs> <laughs> no, but uh, honestly, Bob, uh, I've I've never heard anybody explain this so well uh, that the big A is about non-context driven t- uh, school of testing, and the small A is context driven school of testing agile. It's it's the best way of explaining it. Thank you so much. I'm going to use this actually when I'm explaining somebody about it. You're welcome. So final questions for the group here, and both of you can answer to the same question. Uh, what is the one thing that you are looking forward to at this STPCon? Mary, please. Uh, the wine for the wine country. No, I'm um, sorry. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. You know, I like, uh, my thing is just listening to what, listening and learning, right? You know, listening to others, learning from them, and then just the conversations that we have. And so it's one of my times that I come and, and I better myself because of things I learned from, from conferences like STPCon and the quality of speakers that you have. So that's, that's what I'm looking forward to. And, and for me, it's, mm-hmm. it's what Mary said, but it, with a little emphasis on the, con, the confer or the conference part. I, I want to encourage anyone who's listening to this. Uh, to come up and talk to Mary Thorne because she has a lot to uh, she has a lot to share and she's she's just a wonderful person to hang around and come up to me and don't be shy so don't don't be shy uh, and don't look at us as know it alls or anything like that we're we're learners and we're attendees just like everyone else so let's let's go and have a fun conference period uh, in San Francisco I'm looking to meet people I'm looking to talk about testing and agile. Uh, I'm, I'm, I'm interested in your challenges and I might have some ideas for you to try, but I'm certainly not going to tell you how to solve your problems. And we're going to have context driven discussions. And at the end of the day, maybe we can have that glass of wine. Uh, 
It's it's interesting that I have um, so far interviewed uh, men and women in same numbers, and our women leaders seem to like uh, the after hours and wine more. So I, and I'm, I'm I'm totally glad, <laughs> okay with that. I'm actually liking that. So, uh, we'll definitely like to hang out with you, Mary, this time. Yeah, that'd be great. Um, one one final question, though you've already actually given a good advice to the audience. Um, since you've been coming to STP for some for a while and you've attended uh, and participated in STP Con before, and something keeps bringing you back to STP Con, so do you want to tell something to the audience? And and I know Bob, you've done a fair bit, but if there is anything more you would like uh, to tell the audience about the program overall uh, for STP Con and why they should attend, besides networking and. I think it's the quality of the speakers, and I think it's the focus. Uh, so uh, I th- the, the reason for me, STPCon, is appro- the speakers are approachable in general. So you have world-class speakers. You have a world-class venue. Uh, you have uh, a conference committee, if you will, or, or you know the folks that are putting it on who really care about the experience. Uh, and you heard that earlier with me. It's about people. Pe- I know I sound like a broken record, but people, people, people. Uh, but just great people, and it's a great learning experience. Uh, what I'm emphasizing is, so come, get engaged, uh, and then leverage all of the opportunities. And the opportunities aren't just in the workshops. They're between the workshops. Uh, they're in the evenings. They're in the mornings. Uh, they're in the mm-hmm. hallways. You're going to learn. If you, Here's a metric for dis, you know for discovering if you've had a good conference. Uh, don't just measure the learnings in the sessions, measure the learnings. You should be learning more outside the sessions. And and the onus there is on the attendee. So that's why I come, but that's also one of the reasons I really enjoy STP is I think I think the overall environment really is conducive to that. Awesome. Mary, you want to you have some message for the listeners here? This will be my third trip to STPCon and w- the the quality of the conference itself, the, the facilities, the uh, things that that they do to to really engage things like this, right? Things like this STP Con um, radio show, things that uh, really try to engage the, the the attendees is something I really enjoy about it. I listen to these podcasts, I listen to uh, the speakers that they have to come, so that I can make a better informed decision when I get there of what I want to hear. So I really like that about STV Con, the, the marketing and the things that they do to, to drive you into their conference. Uh, and then it helps better prepare to me so that when I get into the conference to go to the things that really are going to interest me. I've been to several conferences where I just randomly pick something because I don't know what else to go to. And and I get in there, I'm sometimes a little bit disappointed on on that. And so uh, being able to, to engage in things like this so that I actually can know what I'm getting into as far as the right things that are going to interest me for where I'm at in my career. I, I, I appreciate that about STCon. Awesome. Thank you so much. Thanks, Bob. Thank Mar- thanks, Mary, for your time and for being great guests on the show. It was actually almost an uh, enlightening interview <laughs> for me uh, of both of you. So thank you so much. Oh, uh, everyone, out, everyone out there, thanks for listening. Feel free to message us or tweet us if you have any comments to share. Also, if you're not already scheduled for the conference, I strongly encourage you to get yourself registered. Go to stpcon.com and pick one of the several options available. Looking forward to see you all at the upcoming STP at San Francisco. Thanks, Bob. Thanks, Mary. It was great. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Thanks for joining us for this episode of STP Radio. Stay tuned for more episodes, and don't forget to check out stpcon.com to learn more about the conference being held at the Westin San Francisco Airport Hotel, April 4th through 7th.